So um, this is part of a regular series of um, tutorials or webinars given as part of the National Supercomputer Service, Archer, which is a central uh, supercomputer resource. Um, but EPCC is also involved in um, this visitor program called HPC Europa, uh, which is um, we've run quite a lot many times in the past, but it's recently started up again. And we thought it'd be interesting to Archer users in the HPC community in general, uh, really um, as to how you could uh, use this program potentially to do collaborative research with other um, HPC centers around Europe, but also, you know, if you knew people who might want to come to the UK um, to, to, to do collaborative research, then they could maybe apply to come to an HPC center in the UK through through the program. So that's why we've made it as part of the Archer the Archer series, we thought it was definitely relevant to the community. And um, I'll now pass over to Catherine to give more details on the programme. Okay, thanks, David. Just give me a minute to share my screen. There we go. Right, you should be able to see a web page now. Is that right? Yeah, yep, I can see that fine. Yep, that's great. Okay, uh, it does look a little bit small to me. I don't know if you can see it clearly on your own screens. Um, but this is the HPC Europa web page, and I'm just going to talk through it a little bit so that to give some information about the, the program. And obviously, you can come back to the web page and find all the information later. So the URL is www.hpc europa.org. And on the front page here, it tells you what HPC Europa is. HPC Europa is an EC funded program. It's basically focused on transnational access, which means giving access to um, important facilities. In this case, it's high performance computing systems uh, to people who want to travel between one country and another. Um, HPC Europa gives access to some of the best computing HPC computing services in Europe. But it's the other aspect of the program, it's not just access to HPC systems, it's also about scientific collaboration, working with somebody who's in the same field as yourself. And technical support is provided by the HP center, HPC centres who are involved in the program. So anybody applying to the program does not have to be an expert already. They can come and they will get help and guidance from the centres and travel and living expenses are reimbursed. So we'll cover your travel costs and we pay a little bit towards your living and accommodation expenses during your visit. The goals of the programme, the programme runs for four years. It's been running for nearly a year already. We have another three years until the end of April 2021. Uh, we expect to support 1,200 visitors over those four years. That's not just at EPCC, that's with all the partners in the programme. And we expect to offer about 100 million CPU hours in total. So you can see that that works out as about 100,000 hours per visitor, roughly. Um, so it's not an enormous, enormous amount of... Yeah. That's ballpark. So um, it's not a really, really enormous amount of computing power, but it's certainly a lot more than people would normally have through their own, their own access. Um, and then those who require much more would be encouraged to go via Price or some other system get more money to get more uh, computing time. So transnational access. I've moved on to the transnational access part of the web page. This explains a bit more about the program and the sites that are involved. You will notice on the web page that there's also networking activities and research activities in the HPC Europa program, but I won't discuss them because that's not the main focus of the program. Those are just things to support the visitor program basically. They're just additional activities that the partners are involved in. Um, you don't need to know about the regional programme because that doesn't really affect UK based researchers. Um, if anybody's joining this from outside the UK and wants to know more about that, you could look at the web page in the first instance. Um, there's some information here about just general, general rules. One of the things we should point out is that in principle, you should be working on research that can be published in open literature. That's really part of the, um, the conditions that the European Commission sets on this funding. And we explain on this web page what you have to do at the end of, your, of the project in terms of paperwork and reports. 
there's a small amount of um, reporting and questionnaires to be done, uh, and those will be published in open, well, in, on web pages or in a, a brochure or whatever. So if you were working on something that you were not happy with being produced in, in something online, you might want to contact us to discuss this beforehand. Um, the partners in the project, there are 10 partners, as you can see from the web page. Of those, all but one offer the Transnational Access Program. So it's a bit confusing because people think that they can go to France because there's a partner in France and France used to be involved in the visitor program. But unfortunately, the French partners didn't want to be involved in the visitor program this time. However, we have partners in the UK and Ireland, Sweden and Finland, the Netherlands, Germany, Spain, Italy and Greece. And you have, you're not allowed to apply within your own country, obviously. So UK based researchers would have to apply to one of the other countries. So you've got a choice of eight countries there. And obviously, as David mentioned earlier, if you're based in the UK, you can benefit from this program in two different ways. You could apply for a visit to go yourself to one of the countries that takes part in the program, or you could host a visitor to come to your department and then they could come from anywhere within Europe. So there is a, somewhere on the web page, there is a list of all the countries that are eligible, eligible to participate, but it's basically the European Union countries plus the designated associated states. And it's about 40 different countries, I think, can participate. And there's a, also a small amount of access reserved for researchers who are in other countries uh, outside Europe. But we're only allowed to give a, a very small proportion of our access to these people. So it's still possible for people outside Europe to take part, but they probably have to have a very good case to receive the funding. And again, if you have any questions about that, we can provide more details. So if you go to the web, if you want to find out more about any of the centres that are involved in the programme and the facilities they have, then if you go to the transnational access part of the web page and click on any one of the centres, you will see some information there and they talk about the facilities that they have available and give some general information about the, um, the sites as well. So if you were applying for a visit, there would be two things you would want to consider. I think primarily you would want to find somebody who worked in your research field and you had a good scientific collaboration with. But also another aspect of it that you would have to think about would be the centre you visit and whether their resources are suitable for the work you want to do. Um, now, this would be the first place to start by looking at the information here, but you might not know from that whether that's suitable for the work you plan to do or not. And again, if there were any questions you had about that, you just need to contact us and we will try to guide you towards the right place. Um, we also do try to be accommodating towards people so that if somebody has applied to a centre and maybe wants GPUs and at EPCC at the moment we don't have any GPU facilities we can offer to visitors, we would notice that at the selection stage and say, well, we can't support this visitor, but maybe somebody else who's got GPUs could do. And we would, if there was enough time in the evaluation process, we might pass that across to the other centre or we would ask someone to reapply and, and point them towards the correct centre to apply to. We've got guidelines on the web page to help you understand what you have to do. And towards the end of this, I will also show you what the application form looks like. Um, the application can be completed in stages, so you don't have to log on and complete the whole thing at once. You can save each section as you go. So if you hadn't, for example, decided who the best host for your project would be, you could start off the application and maybe write in your project proposal. But in the meantime, keep searching for somebody who was an appropriate host. So you'd be able to save it and come back and you could complete it a day later, a week later, even for the following selection process. If you didn't manage to get it done by deadline, it's just saved there and you can always log on and access your partly completed form and come back to it. So a little bit about the application process. We have four closing dates every year. They're approximately, but not quite every three months. And the selection meetings 
tend to be around six weeks after the closing date, although this depends on a number of factors. Um, we, uh, we have two stages of the evaluation process. Initially, the application is reviewed by the HPC Centre to look at the technical aspects, to look at whether there's a good case for funding from the HPC Europa programme and to see whether the code is suitable for the facilities available and the amount of resources requested are reasonable and this sort of thing. And at the same time as the HPC Centre is looking at that, the host will be asked to fill in an evaluation to say their level of interest in the application and to give any details about any existing collaborations and any interest in the work in general. And then once we've received those two reviews, we then pass those reviews along with the application to our scientific user selection panel, the SASP, who are independent from the programme. And each application will be reviewed by two of those independently. And then we meet to make the decisions on who gets accepted. Um, so here there are some points. So you should always apply. So that, that because there's six weeks roughly for the evaluation process, between four and six weeks for the evaluation process, and then you need some time to organize the logistics of your visit, we recommend that um, you apply at least two months to you apply to visit at least two months after the closing date. You shouldn't even think that you could come earlier than that because it would just not be possible. Um, but on the other hand, you have to come within six months of receiving the decision letter. So you would probably look to, to apply for a closing date somewhere between two and two and eight months before you want to visit. Um, what else should I say about this? Visits, yes, visits should be between two and 13 weeks and, and two weeks only in exceptional cases really because the reviewers tend to take the opinion that um, two weeks is not really sufficient. So although we say technically two weeks is possible, you should really aim for probably three weeks as minimum, unless you have a very good reason. And the maximum you can come for is 13 weeks and that can't be extended because that's a European Commission rule. Um, the average visit length should be sort of six to seven weeks. And if you want to come for a full three months, you should really make a good case for that because we realize that a lot of people just put that as the, the standard. Oh, it's the most I can ask for, I'll ask for that. But you need to make clear why you really want to come for 13 weeks if you do that. Um, there's a whole lot of information here about the different sections of the, um, the application form and how to fill it in. And everybody who applies should read these because many people don't and many people send us emails saying, well, what about this? I don't understand what I have to put there. And the information is usually in the guidelines for when people ask us questions. And also the reviewers really don't like it if you haven't provided the information you're asked for. It sounds really like stating the obvious, but you would be very surprised how few people actually do read the guidelines before they start to fill out the form. There's also a fact here, linked from the guidelines. Um, this tells you a little bit about the funding. It makes clear that there is not a salary associated with this program. We just cover your additional costs. You will not find information about the specific um, costs and how it works on the web page because every centre is slightly different. We all have the same budget, but we have slightly different conditions depending on the instant we have to not just have the european commission rules on how to administer this program each center has its own organizational rules so whereas at one center it might be a flat rate fee in other centers you might have to provide receipts for your expenses and we haven't provided provided information on the web page here simply because it, it just gets very complicated it would be too much information and really we don't want people to be choosing which centre they go to on the basis of these little details. We want them to be looking for the best place for them in terms of the HPC centre and in terms of the scientific collaboration. All of the centres will give you enough money to cover your costs and um, that should be all you really need to know from that point of view. Um, we can also 
work with SMEs. We've not had much participation from SMEs in the past, but SMEs can act as hosts for visitors. So if anybody had a, an SME in a foreign country that they thought might be willing to host them, that would be a possibility. And in terms of the host, I do not know why this page is displaying like this because it didn't display earlier like this. Uh, it displayed everything across each person across this uh, line, which was much easier to read. But if you click on the host list, you will see that we have all of our hosts listed here. And hopefully you would find somebody in your field. If you wanted to know whether the person was already associated with the program, you could search up here. And I know one of my colleagues, for example, is there. So it brings up his details and you can see that he's associated with the program. But there's no need for the person, if there's somebody you want to work with, there's absolutely need for them to be in this host list already. We can add new hosts all the time. Uh, this is not an exclusive list. This is just a list of people who have been involved in the program in the past. So it would give you an indication of the sort of people we work with. One important thing to say is that you don't have to go to the university that's associated with the HPC Centre. So, for example, looking at the case of EPCC, you don't need to go to a host department in the University of Edinburgh if you're hosted by EPCC. And we currently have visitors in the University of Bath and um, one of the London universities. And we've had people at Oxford and Cambridge recently. We have people in Glasgow and so on. So it, it, this is the same in all the different centres in Germany. You don't have to go to Stuttgart, for example. And in Finland, you don't have to go to Helsinki, where CSC is based. You find the best person in that country. Um, right, earlier on, I filled in a test application form just so that I could show what the application form is like. It looks quite long when you see it now, but do remember, as I said, that you can save it in sections and come back to it. So you can complete it over any number of days, over any amount of time. So we gather some general information about yourself and your organisation, your research group. And then we ask, how long do you want to come and which centre do you want to go to? Who's your host? Have you contacted the person or not? There's no requirement to contact your host in advance, but um, it clearly, if you've got the agreement of a host and you've managed to find someone who is enthusiastic and you've established that in advance, that's clearly a benefit to you when it comes to getting the host to fill in the statement of support for your visit. And then the reviewers will say, oh, that's good. This person really wants to work with this person. They contacted them in advance. If we're in a bit of doubt about it, then they say, well, they didn't bother contacting the host. It doesn't look so, so convincing. And there may be good reasons for it if your application's a bit late, and we can always let the reviewers know that. But generally, if you can contact the person in advance, that is much better. Um, you can add a new host who's not already in the list. And you can give some information about any existing collaboration you have. Then you have to give details about the project and you would provide some information about the code that you're working on, how much of it you've written yourself, how large it is, what language it's written in, any libraries you need to use. And this is information both about uh, any serial code and any parallel code that exists. We look a bit at the motivation for your visits and a bit about your programming experience. But all of this information, a lot of these are drop down boxes, so it doesn't take too long to fill in. Um, your present computing resources, this is so we can see what you use now. And then the estimated computing resources you expect to use. Now, this is a best guess. And honestly, most people, well, maybe not most people, but a large number of people underestimate or overestimate quite significantly how much they need. Um, there's a section here that sometimes confuses people. Please specify the value. And this is so that we can see how the number up here has been calculated. So if you can tell us what you think uh, um, the elapsed time by the number of, of cores used by the number of runs, that lets us see whether you've just plucked a number out of the air or whether you've actually really thought about it and, and justified what that figure is. Um, 
clearly I was filling this in as a um, test thing and I didn't check to see whether these numbers match that. So if they don't, that's fine. But you, if you were filling this in for real, you would want to check that. Um, the project proposal is the most important part. This is where you provide all the details, a bit of context about the research and details about the work that you would be doing during the visit. And your case for HPC Europa funding explains why, not just why this is a good project to do, but why you need money from HPC Europa in order to carry out this collaborative visit. So this would need to provide justification in two respects. One, that you need access to more powerful resources than you normally have. And two, that your host has a shared research interest with you and that it's likely to lead to successful collaboration. The project work plan is often missed out or not very well filled in by applicants. And this is quite an important part. Here we want to know not the bigger picture of what your research project is, but rather the details of exactly what you want to do during your visit, the objectives of the visit, and any specific tasks which you think you will be doing during the visit. This is so that the reviewers can say not just, oh, this project has laudable aims, but that um, you need to um, you need to say, well, what are you going to do when you're here? Not just what is the goal of this project two years down the line. Um, so we need to have a list of identified tasks to be carried out during the visit and an approximate timeline for each of these. And people who provide detailed work plans in this section are much more likely to be accepted in our experience. So you can add a CV, either as a PDF or just type it in in text, list of publications and then just finding out where you heard about HPC Europa. Um, and that's the application form. Training opportunities, I just thought I would highlight this. There's also a list here of opportunities for training provided by the HPC Europa Consortium Partners and also projects that we collaborate with. So these are, for example, the EPCC courses are given here, but um, also courses given, for example, in, uh, by Cinica in Italy, by BSC in Spain. So these could be useful for visitors coming to the centre or they could be useful for visitors beforehand as well. They might want to take part in some training before they go. So that's a useful page to know about. And then you can follow us on Twitter to find out. If you have a look at our Twitter page, you will find out um, quite a lot about visitors who you see. We've got here visitors who are coming for visits you can see where they're going to. This one's going to Aalto University in Finland and will be using CSC's uh, resources. And we've put in, if, yeah, this will give you a very big overview of the sort of work that people are doing. We've mentioned, we've put in links to blog articles from visitors, talks. So this will give you a, a kind of overview of what sort of visitors we have. They're in all sorts of computational fields and for example here's one optimizing food processing was one of our recent visitors uh, projects and there was also one about identifying things that have fallen off boats whether it was containers that had fallen off ships or people that had gone overboard so there's a whole variety of areas that people work in and uh, one final thing I'd like to say about HPC Europa, which makes it a really nice programme and shows how successful it is as something useful for people's careers, is that many of my colleagues, maybe not many, a few of my colleagues, have come from HPC Europa. This is how we first knew them. And over the years, quite a number of people have come to work at EPCC and I think probably have gone on to jobs at the other centres as well, where their first contact with the centre has been through HPC Europa. And similarly, some of them have gone on to further positions with their host departments and ha, um, have also done things like producing joint publications and having reciprocal visits that have gone on after the HBC Europa visit period has been over. Um, so we've seen some really nice long lasting effects from this programme as well as just the benefits of the short term visit. So I think that's all I wanted to say. So has anyone got any questions? So, sorry, I want to butt in, but just to say, um, 
I don't know if you want to just give a couple of sort of, <coughs> excuse me, you know, standard model ideas for what, it, what a visit would be like, you know, maybe like, a, I mean, someone asked me about this this morning, and I was saying like, you could have a German chemist who wants to work with somebody in, in Bristol and use the HPC systems, the EPCC, and they would, they would apply, and if they were accepted, they would go to Bristol, work with the, the person there on their scientific side, but also use our facilities and get technical support from us. I, I don't, that's the kind of, that would be a sort of a, one sort of type of canonical visit, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, I should say as well that I did kind of focus on the fact that people are going to collaborate with people. Didn't really mention that it's possible to to be hosted within an HPC centre as well. So you could actually come and collaborate with people in EPCC or, you, well, if you're in the UK, you couldn't do that. But you could go and work with people in BSC or you could go and work with people um, in CSC in Helsinki or whatever. Um, but yes, David's right as well that most people, most people currently um, don't come to Edinburgh. I would say actually only at the moment about a third to a quarter of our visitors are coming to Edinburgh, the EPCC visitors. They are going to universities all around Britain and um, they can use our facilities here. We also have a slightly strange thing. EPCC is a bit special as well in this programme because we work together with iCheck in Ireland in a way that the other centres don't, because iCheck didn't couldn't quite come in as a partner on their own account because of the facilities they had weren't quite sufficient enough. But we work together with iCheck so that visitors coming to work in with a, in collaboration with someone in the UK can actually use the facilities at iCheck, and people going to work with a host department in Ireland can work with the facilities at EPCC and this is a little bit different from the scenario in all the other centres. So if you were looking at it from the point of view of a UK based host um, and you had a, if you wanted a visitor to come and work with you in the UK they could use Archer they, but they could also use the facilities at um, in, in Ireland or vice versa, if you were an uh, HPC Europa visitor going to Ireland, this doesn't really affect us because people, UK people couldn't use Archer anyway through HPC Europa, but people going to Ireland could in principle use Archer as well. So, but otherwise, so if you're in the UK and you want a visitor to come to you, it doesn't matter if you're not in Edinburgh, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, so I guess that the um, so so Ryan's got an interesting. So just so Ryan's um, just said, um, just, could the scope of the pro open project be going to work at an HPC centre and trying to say MP could parallelise an existing non-parallel code? So I, mean, I can answer that because I was a, a a predecessor to a predecessor to a predecessor of HPC Europa, but I went on an equivalent visit myself to Barcelona Supercomputing Centre in two thousand, and my research was on writing a parallel application um to look at mixing mpi and open mp and so i that was a that was research into hpc so it was natural for me to be hosted by an hpc center whereas if you're doing research that uses hpc like you're a chemist physicist engineer you might pick a host who is, who is an applications expert and um so i think that i think the only um that's the kind of thing I think that would fund. The only issue is that I don't know how much um, focus there is now, Catherine, on people using large amounts of computer time, because if you're, although it's a worthy aim to to to, to work in HPC Centre to, to develop a, a you know a GPU parallel GPU code, you wouldn't be able to guarantee to use a lot of CPU time, but you'd be yeah. benefiting from the expertise. Is that an issue or is that not an issue? It depends on how much how much competition there is for places and how picky the panel are being but yes it could be that they would say well that's not a very good case because they're not going to use much time if you could i yeah, guess I mean, though that if you picked an hpc center that had a very large gpu parallel gpu machine you could make the correct argument that they have the expertise and they have the machine that i can run it on so even if yes. i don't use a lot of time access to the machine and the local expertise is critical to getting a um uh, I'm, actually, I'm sure there was a case in the last election meeting where there was something similar to that where it didn't really look like there was much 
work that was actually going to run on the machines, but the development work underlying it was going to be very beneficial to the HPC community, and therefore the panel thought it was, you know, it was worthy and worth supporting. I think it's a, it's a bit of a grey area, and it does depend on on how picky the, the reviewers are being. But so Ryan's saying here, I think about expertise. So I mean, there is this slight. There's a sort of a there's a sort of a balancing act between exploiting. I mean, you're supposed to do two things with HPC Europa. One is exploit expertise, and the other is exploit the HPC facilities. But I think with something reasonably, um, um, I think that for you, for Ryan's particular thing, I think I think a more class a more likely application to succeed is I have an MPI version I want to extend it to be mixed MPI CUDA for example I think there's a risk you know if you're trying to really go for the big bang there's a risk that there's no sort of halfway house do you see what I mean so I think I think I think we've generally not had success I think with people who've applied to come and work on parallelizing serial codes and that's just I mean I've not been deeply involved in HPC Europe but that's my my feeling um, okay it's open MP well then yeah I mean I think I mean, there's definitely something in there, I think. Um, yeah, um, I think that's, I think it's a possibility. Um, um, it might be, yeah. Yeah, uh, you could send us maybe some, just a, a sort of brief outline and we can have a look and see whether this would be suitable if you want. I think in, in general, I mean, it, it's true of all applications that are around anything to do with the national service or, 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 or any programs like this, rather than spending a huge amount of time, you know, crafting an application and sending it in. If you have questions, just get in touch. Just say, you know, I'm thinking about yeah. doing this. Is it worth doing it? You know, we often get that with applications for computer time on Archer where you know, people have a lot of work in the application, but if they contacted us, five minute chat would have told them that actually, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't going to be a goer. Um, so I think, you know, just opening up a dialogue is definitely, um, definitely a good, um, uh, uh, a good thing to do. Yeah, I would encourage that. And the other thing you could, the other thing you could argue there, which is, I mean, it's, it's true is that if they, if, if, if the host had, um, their own application which ran in, in that mode you could learn from it you know that's another thing you could say well they've already done this so I'll work with them and you know run it and see how it works and try and you know that's the kind of thing you maybe so you do need to address those points I think you know why why is the local expertise important but also why is access to HPC facilities important but it I mean the classic one is um so I'm not slagging off chemists here but you know I want to simulate this new molecule you know I'm going to work with professor um, Christine Bloggins at Bristol, who she's an expert in the chemistry, and I'm going to run my program on Archer and burn thousands of CPU hours. That's a sort of a straight down the line classical one, but I think there is some latitude for more, not for more, um, yeah, for, for ones that don't fit that model, but you need to justify it probably a bit more strongly. Yeah. Any further questions? I have a quick question here. What is the rate of success? Like, how many applications do you receive, uh, and how many get so, accepted? That's a really good question. I would say, having done three um, selection meetings so far under this program, I'm actually not sure. I haven't got the stats for that. But under the old program, it was about a two-thirds acceptance rate, and I mean, I think it's broadly similar at the moment. But I really haven't checked that. Um, so I couldn't, I couldn't say for certain. And also, obviously, at the first selection meeting, we're able to accept everyone who's good enough because we've got lots of space available. And as time goes on, perhaps we need to be a bit more selective. Um, but yeah, it was it was about a, six, a sort of sixty five percent or so um, acceptance rate for most of the previous program. I guess, Catherine, you're supposed to have made contact with your host in advance, are you? Or? You, don't have to have made, you don't really have to have made uh, contact with your host, but I would strongly encourage yeah. it. And if it's not, if you can't find the right, I mean, people come to us first of all and say sometimes, oh, I can't, uh, who should I have as a host? Well, you're the person that knows your research best, right? So really, it's better for you to try and identify somebody. But if you're having a great deal of difficulty, you can come and ask us because we do also know we have got experience from having run this program for quite a number of years. We sometimes know about people who are working in this field or that field at such and such a place. So we can give suggestions, but ultimately, I always feel the applicant knows their research best and knows who's 
best place to to work with them and so if the the applicant can do that you know do that finding out a host and then maybe asking us if if that would be a suitable person at that stage that's fine um it's much better to to speak to the host and find out if they're interested otherwise you might find your application gets rejected because your host wasn't interested yeah so again that was why i was saying you know rather than doing <laughs> a big bang approach it's best you know just yeah. chat to the person in advance and clearly yeah, yeah. Absolutely. and the, the host might have input as well if you make contact with the, the proposed host person they might have suggestions about things you could put into your your proposal and it would make it a stronger proposal not just because you think the host is going to support you but because the host might have given you extra ideas to put into the application yeah, so a classic one might be the host might say, well, if you just come a month later, we've got an international workshop on CUDA applications you can attend. Just little things like that, I think, can be very useful. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Sorry, again, I um, have another quick question. So if one gets accepted once, uh, so you prefer not to take people again? So like, how often would you... Yeah. In principle, we give priority to people who haven't been before. Uh, that is one of the things we have to do. But it doesn't mean you can't apply again. However, you're only allowed a maximum of 13 weeks um, for your the work that you're doing. If you move on to a completely different field of research, then you can apply again if you've had 13 weeks. Now, what exactly defines a completely different field of research is a bit open to interpretation. So I would say take it as a sort of uh, more or less understood that 13 weeks is the maximum. So that's probably another good reason for not applying for a 13 week visit straight off. You apply for a seven week visit, you can apply for a six week visit later or, you know, a nine week visit and then a four week visit or something. And although you are perhaps not a priority because you've been before, if you can show that the first visit was beneficial and that coming back would, would still be you know, further beneficial, um, not just because you're coming back because it was quite nice, but because there's a concrete reason to do it. Um, and maybe you wouldn't be able to do this from your home institute, then there's no reason why not. And we do have repeat visitors. Um, it has happened. Um, so yeah. Great. So if you want to, if you've got any other questions or you need any more information, if you just contact us, well, you can contact me directly um, or you can contact info at hpceuropa.org, I think. Maybe, no, actually, I think it's staff at hpceuropa.org these days. Um, anyway, if you go to the web page, you'll find our contact details. Just get in touch and we will help you with any further questions you have. Just the final thing to say is that HPC Europa will carry on beyond Brexit without any any oh, yes. major without any major issues uh, other than who knows about visas and things. But the program, the funding, that the, the, that will not be affected. You know, the, the principles and funding of the program, the details might change, but the overall operation won't, won't be affected by Brexit. I, I guess that's true, isn't it, Catherine? Just to, just to reassure people. Any programs that have been signed and any contracts that have been signed will just continue. Yeah through the end of their cycle. So that for us is April 2021, it's still some time off. Yeah. And the next closing date is the 17th of May, which I completely forgot to say. 17th of May, and then I think the next one's in um, early September. It's here. Yes, yeah, so on the, the home page, it gives you at the bottom, there's the, the calendar. So 17th of May, and then the 6th of September, if you don't get ready for the 17th of May. And then the final one of the year is the 15th of November. OK, thanks, everyone. So um, so I think that's the end of the seminar. So goodbye and thanks for attending. Right, thank you, everyone. We look forward to receiving your applications. <laughs>